All right, good morning. So first, kind of like what some others have already said, I want to thank anybody who has you know, served in the military, is serving in the military, has a loved one who has served in the military, any number of connections there. Just thank you for your service and your sacrifice. My own grandfather served in the Navy um, back, uh, well, it was a long time ago, but I remember he always, some of his fondest memories were of the Navy. So thank you for your service and sacrifice. Um, I want to tell you, uh, well, we're actually going to be concluding our time in Jonah today. So, but I want to begin it with a story. When I was, when I was a kid, I, I grew up outside of Washington, D.C. And so, you know, Washington, D.C. is a crazy place. If you've ever been there, the traffic is horrendous. Um, I think it would take an act of God for me to go back to that place. Um, but I remember as a kid, I was, it was elementary school, and I remember it vividly. I went to D.C. for the first time, and I was going with a friend of mine, or a couple of friends of mine, and one of my friend's parents. And we were going to go see some museums, and we went to see, I think it was the Air and Space Museum, and it was awesome. I mean, it was so cool. I was in elementary school. I got to see these incredibly cool-looking planes, and my parents gave me some spending money that I could get, like, a toy with, and I got this, like, it was like this little gun toy thing, and it would shoot an airplane out of it, and it would glide and everything. It was the coolest thing. And so, but what I remember the most really wasn't seeing all the planes. It was actually a little thing that took place as we were going to a different museum. See, we were walking on the streets of Washington, D.C., and I, I was elementary school age. And I remember looking over to the side, and I see this mound of blankets and this and there were blankets and there were washcloths and there were towels this huge mound on top of a bench and I was looking at it and I saw that there was a person underneath the blankets sitting there cold on the streets it was cold outside and immediately what welled up inside of me was I was afraid I was scared for this person this person needed help and everyone was just walking by. And it blew my mind. I was like, what in the world is going on? I felt terrible for this person. We need to help this person. Anxiety and fear welled up inside of me. And I looked at my friend's parents, and he worked in Washington, D.C. And I remember looking at him I'm like, why are they not doing anything? They're just walking right by this person. And I kept watching them and looking back as we kept going and uh, and then eventually we got up to another person, a woman. She was sitting on the ground, and she had a cup right out next to her and a little sign that said, you know, please help. And again, everything welled up inside of me. I was nervous. I was scared for this person. And my friend's parents are doing nothing. And I'm like, what is wrong? What is going on? So I ran up to them. I'm like, hey, do you, do you see the lady over here? She, she needs help. Do you see? And they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, we see. And uh, is there a disconnect? Am I missing something? So I'm like, well, I've got some leftover money that my parents gave, some spending money. I'm like, can I have that money and give it to that, to that woman? They're like, oh, yeah, sure. So I go and I put the money in the cup. You know, that was the first time I'd ever seen a homeless person. It was the first time. And my reaction to seeing that person was pretty raw. I didn't have a lot of filters that things were passing through. I saw somebody who was desperately lost, and I needed to help. That was the simplest gut reaction that I had. And, of course, you know, as I grow older and there's different things, you know, Perhaps that money was misused. It could have been used on drugs, any number of things. There's certain filters that I have now that are perhaps wise. There's also some filters maybe that are perhaps not. But the question that I want to ask is when we look at a fallen world, what is our response? When we look at a world filled with darkness and, and lostness, what is our response? You know, I think sometimes the response can be more along the lines of maybe it's anger, maybe it's frustration, maybe it's fear. Maybe the lost world becomes more of just an impedance to living the comfortable life that I'd like to live right now. 
maybe more of an impedance. You know, we acknowledge definitely God's loyal love to his people, Israel, and certainly to the bride of Christ, the church. But I think sometimes we forget God's care and compassion towards the lost, towards the nations. And there's kind of a disconnect that's there. There's, a, there's God's heartbeat. Boom, 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 boom. And our beat doesn't always match. There's a disconnect in there. And so the question I want to broach today is simply a checkup. How are, how are our hearts as followers of Christ? Does our heart more mirror God's heartbeat? Does it more beat in tune with his heart? Or does it beat in tune with the world's? You know, we're going to be in Jonah 4. So if you want to turn there, go ahead. And like I said, we're going to finish out our time in Jonah today. But, you know, we're today, we are going to get finally to the root of the issue with Jonah that we've seen. He's fled. God called Jonah. Hey, Jonah, I need you to go over to Nineveh. I need you to go over there and pre preach a message to them of repentance. And Jonah, he just rolled out the other direction. And today we're going to see the root of the issue that's there. And it's not fear. It's not, you know, oh, I don't have enough time to do that. Oh, I don't think I'm equipped to do that. I think the root of the issue is Jonah's own heart. And I think there is a disconnect between Jonah's heart and God's heart here. They are beating at a different rhythm. So first today, I'd like to consider our hearts as believers and our own potential disconnect that we might have with God's own heart sometimes. And then I want to look at how we be can begin to realign our beat to match the beat of God's own heart. And so in general, like I said, you know, there is a disconnect, I think, sometimes between our hearts as believers and God's. You know, when I was, when I, just after college, I was going on a trip. I was going snowboarding, um, and we were going up through these mountains. I think it was in West Virginia. I can't even remember where it was. And you guys remember, see, now with the smartphones, things have changed so much. But you remember when the new, they were brand new, the coolest thing is that satellite little receiver thing. You'd stick it up in the window, and it would tell you where to go. And if you got off your path, it would reroute you. You remember those things, little satellite deals? Well, we, we, one of my friends had that. It was like, cool, we don't need to print off any directions. We'll get there. This thing will take us right to the front door, right? Well, we get going through the mountains of West Virginia, and we saw a message on there that was kind of disconcerting. Satellite signal lost. And we see our car driving all over the place through the mountains of West Virginia. Our, our thing was totally worthless at that point. We had totally lost the picture of where we were going and where we needed to go. And I think the same is true of Jonah here. A miracle has just happened, right? A whole nation has repented before Jonah's God. A whole nation. And we see Jonah's reaction. It's not praising God for what has just taken place in Nineveh. It's anger. It's remorse. In the Hebrew, the language is, it was evil to Jonah with great evil. That's the literal reading of the Hebrew. It was evil to Jonah with great evil. It was evil to Jonah that these people of Nineveh repented. Let me read verses 1 through 3 here in Jonah 4. But Jonah was greatly displeased, and that's that he was, it was evil to Jonah with great evil, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? This is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O oh Lord, take my life, for it's better for me to be dead than to live. It was evil to Jonah with great evil that the nation of Assyria, Nineveh, repented. You know, I think sometimes we can have a sense of this reaction of Jonah 
and ourself as well. Like I've said going up to this, the unfortunate reality of the book of Jonah is that Jonah is a negative character. And unfortunately, the convicting part is that we see ourselves more in Jonah's character as we go through the story of Jonah. You know, I think when we approach an unbelieving world, I think our reaction, it may not be as extreme as Jonah's, but sometimes I think the unbelieving world can be seen as an impedance to getting what we want, to having the comfortable life that we want. It is not easy to go and minister the gospel to an unbelieving world who hates God. It's not easy. And we sacrifice some of our comfort when we do that. You know, I like to think of it as this. We've been given, as believers, if we put our faith in Christ for salvation, we've been given an injection that has cured us from a deadly, deadly disease. Yet I think sometimes we despise those and, and, and don't want to be inconvenienced by those who were just as sick as we once were. I hated God before I became a believer. I hated the thought of him. Is it right for me to despise and avoid being inconvenienced by those who were just as lost as I once was? The temptation, I think, is that we become so concerned with our own comforts and our own situations and we forget sometimes how lost we once were and the loss that we're called to go and minister the gospel to. And I think this kind of points us to the root of the issue. And I think the disconnect that we have, this irregular heartbeat that does not match the beat of God's own heart, I think it sometimes ultimately centers around selfishness. You know, I like the term selfish because it says it, it's so clear Someone who's selfish is self-ish. They're oriented towards self. And, you know, we have this interesting dialogue, this interesting kind of bizarre thing that happens here in Jonah where God gives Jonah a shade plant. Uh, so we're going to pick it up. Read with me verses 6 through 8. Then the Lord God provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about this vine. It's hot over there in Mesopotamia. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the vine so that it was withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said it would be better for me to die than to live. You know the interesting thing about this part? During the whole story, the all four chapters of Jonah, this is the only time where he is delighted. This is the only time where he is happy. It's the only time that's used of Jonah here. This is the first time he's really happy. It's because he's got a shade plant. It's hot. He gets some shade. It cools him off a little bit. And even in the Hebrew, there's kind of a, a, a play going on in the wording. You know how it was evil to Jonah with great evil. Here we see that it's, it's kind of, um, let's see, I lost my place here. Um, but basically there is, uh, he oh yeah. So Jonah says he is happy. He rejoiced with great joy. The play on the words is similar. Jonah rejoiced with great joy. And it was evil to Jonah with great evil. There's a play going on in the words here. This is the only time, this is the first time he's been happy in the, in the whole, whole four chapters. And it's because he's got a shade plant to keep him warm or keep him cool. And then this plant dies and Jonah wanted to die. Do you see the selfishness with that? We've hinted at it all through the first three chapters of Jonah. Even his prayer to God from the belly of the fish. All those first person pronouns in there. There's a selfishness issue going on with Jonah. And now we really see it come to some fruition right here in chapter 4. You know what? For, for us, I think we acknowledge God's loyal love, his kessed love in the Hebrew, his loyal love for his people Israel, and certainly God's loyal love to the very bride of Christ, the church. But the thing is, I think sometimes we forget God's care and concern for the nations. Let me read you verse 11. 
See if you can't see that here. But Nineveh, but Nineveh, God says, has more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and, and many cattle as well. Should I not be concerned about that great city? And this idea of concern here in the Hebrew, I like the word, it's kus. Sounds like kiss, kus in the Hebrew. That's care, concern, compassion towards. God cares for the nations. Part of his heartbeat boom, 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 is for the nations. And Jonah, he had a different picture. He was re- rerouted on his little GPS in a different direction. I want to read you a quote, and I want to see if you guys can pick up where this quote is coming from. Let's see if you can catch it. <clears throat> At this festive season of year, it is more than usually desirable that we should make some slight provision for the poor and destitute who suffer greatly at the present time. Many thousands are in want of common necessaries. Hundreds of thousands are in want of common comforts, sir. Are there no prisons? Plenty of prisons. And the union workhouses, are they still in operation? Both very busy, sir. Those who are badly off must go there. Well, many can't go there. Many would rather die. If they would rather die, they had better do it and decrease the surplus plus population. You guys know what that's from? What you got? Ebenezer Scrooge, you got it. Christmas Carol. Ebenezer Scrooge. And you know what? That's, that's pretty extreme, right? That's pretty extreme. But we can get easily preoccupied with ourselves, our own desires, our own comforts, to the point where the loss can sometimes just become a surplus population in our own hearts. You know what? I see this kind of stuff emerge really clearly on Facebook, interchanges that take place on Facebook, any number of places. I think there is a heart issue that is going on. I'm not a doctor, but that's my diagnosis. I think there's a heart issue going on. So the question that I want to ask now is, our, maybe our heartbeat, it's not in sync with the Lord's. Maybe it's off a little bit. Its rhythm is a bit off. How do we get our hearts? How do we get, begin to get our hearts in tune with God's own heart? How do we get to get those beats to more align? And... I would say we lead our hearts in faithful service. We lead our hearts in faithful service, and there's three aspects of this that I want to cover. The first aspect of leading our hearts to reconnect with God's is to simply know God's heart. You know what, Jonah, he knew God's heart. He knew it. He told God his own heart. Pick up with me. I read it. I'm going to read it again. Verse 2. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Jonah studied the scriptures. He knew the scriptures. He knew God's character, and he resented God for it. He wanted Nineveh to be destroyed, and he resented God for his own character. As believers, we don't want to be like Jonah, most definitely not. I think sometimes, though, we tend towards the other end of the spectrum. We love God. We want to serve him. We want to take the gospel to the nations. Yet maybe we've neglected getting to know him through his word. You know, when I first became a believer, it was, I think I've told you before, it was in the back of an ice cream shop, my senior year of high school. I first put my faith in Christ for salvation. It was an incredible, just, I'll never forget it. You know, I went from hating hating God, hating even the concept or notion of God, to now just praising him because he existed, let alone my own salvation in Christ. After that moment, I went home and I told my parents about it and I was just on fire. I just wanted to go out there and share the gospel with the whole world, light up the whole world with the gospel message, go overseas, any number of things. 
But you know what? I didn't even know who God was. I had never studied his word, never learned of his character. You know, Israel was to represent God to the nations. We talked about that the last time. That was what Israel was to do. They were to represent the holy God of all there is to the nations. And we as the church are to represent Christ to the nations as well. We're ambassadors for Christ. But you know what? I think we need to invest some time in simply getting to know him through his word. Getting to know him through his word. That's aspect one. Aspect two in leading our hearts to follow Christ and leading our hearts is to follow Christ and not follow our own hearts. Have you ever heard the gooey phrase, just follow your heart? Have you ever heard that? It makes me cringe every time I hear that phrase, just follow your heart. It makes me cringe because the question is, is our heart trustworthy? Let me read you something from Jeremiah 17. It says this, <clears throat> The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? You know, Jonah followed his own heart. He did. He followed it. And you see where it got him. He followed his own heart, which was beating at a different tune than God's own heart. And rather than rejoicing at the repentance of a nation before his God, according to God's character, he hated God for it. He resented God for it. And you know what? In the story of Jonah, we don't even know how it ends for Jonah. We don't know how it ends. We see this, that this dialogue ends right here in chapter 4. We don't know the final ending of Jonah. Did he really repent or did he not? The heart is deceitful. The heart is not meant to be followed. It's meant to be led. You know what? The cart can't come before the horse. And it kind of seems backwards. But if we want a heart for the lost, if we want that, uh, the heart that beats for the lost and beats for the nations, we need to go to the lost and we need to go to the nations. You know, when I, in Dallas, I worked with a number of youth and they would go on short-term missionary trips to different places, and it was almost always the same thing. Before they would go, they were excited because they didn't know what God was going to do in them and through them through their experience abroad. They had no idea. They were excited to see what would happen. But it happened every time when they got back. They had a heart for the people that they served. And usually... And in a lot of cases, a short-term missions trip to some place ends up possibly for some becoming a long-term commitment to go back and serve those same people. We lead our hearts. You know, when I was in Dallas as well, I worked with homeless, the homeless down there. I worked at a homeless uh, ministry called Our Calling. And similar to that, before I started there, I was excited to, to work with them. A lot of, you know, a lot of drug issues, a lot of uh, mental issues, a lot of things. And I was excited to work with them and see what God might do, the opportunities that I had. But my heart for the homeless was cultivated through that time that I was there. I didn't wait until my heart beat for the homeless before I went to the homeless. I went to the homeless, and then I saw that my heart began to match God's own heart towards the homeless. The third aspect that I want to cover is to just simply be encouraged because God is committed and patient with our growth in him. You cannot look at the story of Jonah and not see God's patience with Jonah. It bleeds with patience for Jonah. God certainly was committed. He wanted to reach the people of Nineveh, and he wanted Jonah to do it. He could have easily... Just let Jonah sink to the bottom of the sea and brought in someone else to minister that message to the nation, of, the nation of Assyria, the people of Nineveh. He could have, but he was committed to Jonah in this story as well. You know, God is patient as we grow as believers. And you know what? He's committed to our growth 
as we cooperate with him and the growth and the work that he's doing in our lives, he's committed to that. So it's not that we just all of a sudden leave here and our Bibles float along next to us as we go. It's a growth process, and God's committed to it. It's a lifelong process of growth. So we've looked at today just kind of this disconnect that often exists between our hearts as believers and God's own heart for, those, for his people, for the world, for the lost, for the nations. And then we've looked at maybe how we could begin to realign some of those things so that the heartbeats match up. You know, over the course of this journey through Jonah, three messages, four chapters, we've looked at a healthy fear of God. We've looked at being a people committed to the mission that God has given us, the mission to go and make disciples as the church. And we've looked at developing hearts that beat in rhythm with God's own heart. Hearts that beat to make disciples, minister to the lost, and beat for the mission we've been given. You know, I, I kind of titled this series, Oh, the Places You'll Go. Let me tell you, can you imagine what God can accomplish through someone who truly loves the Lord and fears him, who's committed to the mission that we've been given to make disciples of all nations and has a heart for what God is doing in and through his people all over the world. The possibilities are endless. May we be a people who are truly after God's own heart. Let's pray. Lord, uh, thank you for this time that you've given us to go through Jonah and consider Jonah's life and learn from Jonah's life and this sequence of events. Lord, I pray that over the course of time, as you grow us and develop us, Lord, that we would take the mission seriously, that, Lord, we would love you and fear you as followers, that we take your mission seriously, and that we'd work to lead our hearts to align more and more with yours. I pray, Lord, that as you called David your servant, your king, a man after God's own heart, I pray, Lord, that we would be people after your own heart. I pray that our heartbeats would align with yours, that you would use us, Lord, to reach the world, to reach the nations, to reach the people right next door. Thank you, Lord, for your great love and your grace in our lives. And I just pray that we would leave here encouraged and on mission. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen.